Come on up, Ajwa. So Ajwa is going to talk to you about um, some interesting cases with um, skin disease. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Great job on whoever answered that trivia question. Oh, this one. All right. So case scenario number one. So we have a 22-year-old female. She was diagnosed with Crohn's ileocolitis, which was characterized as moderate to severe. She also has a prior history of psoriasis that's been persistent despite topical therapies. Uh, her disease, her Crohn's disease, has persisted despite the use of budesonide and azathioprine. Uh, she's had a colonoscopy that revealed active inflammation in the ileum and in the right colon. Her MRE showed similar findings, but the, and there was no evidence of obstruction. So you asked her to come in to discuss initi initiation of a biological agent to treat her Crohn's disease. Case scenario number two. So we have a 43-year-old female with Crohn's disease who presents with diarrhea and a rash. In 2009, she first developed weight loss and diarrhea. She had an EGD at that time that was consistent with uh, questionable celiac disease, and colonoscopy showed mild colitis. In December of 2017, she had a colonoscopy with pan colitis with ulcerations in the sigmoid colon, thought likely secondary to Crohn's disease. In January of 2018, she started on adalimumab and azathioprine. So in April of that year, she develops a flare of her disease. Her adalimumab trough level is checked, and it's found to be low. She's dose increased to 40 milligrams weekly. And then later that month, her rash worsens. She goes to her dermatologist, and her rash is thought to be anti-TNF-induced psoriasis. Her punch biopsy is pending. In June of 2018, she comes into clinic with fever, diarrhea, and a rash. These are pictures of her rash. The top picture is her axilla, umbilicus, and then um, her perineal area. So there was a case series out of Boston in 2011 looking at uh, IBD patients who were treated with anti-TNF and developed psoriasis. So this case series included 30 patients who developed psoriasis while on an anti-TNF. 80% of these patients had Crohn's disease. 20% had ulcerative colitis. Uh, of these patients who developed psoriasis, 21 of them developed it while on infliximab, 7 on adalimumab, 2 on sertilizumab. And then five of these patients had previously been treated with infliximab without development of psoriasis. And then the median time from start of the anti-TNF to development of psoriasis was six months. So I like this table because it kind of shows you what the outcomes were of these 30 patients. So on the left side, you'd see that about 21, 21 of these patients, or two-thirds of them, responded to topical therapy. Of these patients, 14 were able to continue anti-TNF without an issue. Uh, five of them were switched to a different anti-TNF for non-derm reasons. Of those people who were switched, one had recurrence, and four were able to continue without issue. Uh, nine of these patients had poor response to topical therapy, and then the rest of that arm is um, similar to the left side. So this group combined their 30 patients with a review of 120 previously published cases of anti-TNF-induced psoriasis in IBD patients on uh, TNFs. Uh, so they found that it was more common in women at about 70%. Uh, the most common distributions were a pulmonary plantar at 43% and the scalp at 42%. 41% uh, of these patients responded to topical therapy for psoriasis. 43% uh, required withdrawal of the anti-TNF therapy, and then 52% of those treated with an alternate anti-TNF ended up having recurrence of the rash. So back to our case. Uh, the patient was diagnosed with psoriasis of the umbilicus, trunk, scalp, and axilla. She was treated with steroids for her Crohn's flare and then topical steroids for her psoriasis. The plan is to switch to ustekinumab for Crohn's disease maintenance as an outpatient. Okay, so in these cases, the first one is someone with uh, uh, Crohn's who already had psoriasis, and the second one is someone who developed pretty severe, as you see, psoriasis while on anti-TNF therapy. And she was just, just in the hospital recently, and she's doing uh, quite well. She just got her first infusion of ustekinumab. So uh, you've seen slides like this before. I'm not going to read through with you, but it talks about different approaches to treating Crohn's disease. I want to point out that uh, interleukin-12 up here, 
and interleukin-23 actually share the same P40 subunit. And uh, highly successful uh, in, in uh, psoriasis and now Crohn's disease, you have some type of stimulus to the immune system. IL-12 and IL-23 are both very inflammatory cytokines. And um, when they reach um, the CD4 positive cells, they, they result in formation of interferon gamma and IL-17. And um, usakinumab uh, is an, an antibody, monoclonal antibody that blocks. It actually attaches to the P40 subunit. Uh, so that's why it's IL-12-23, because it's really an anti-P40 uh, antibody, and um, it blocks that process. And it's approved for moderate uh, plaque psoriasis uh, and now for Crohn's disease. And the dosing for Crohn's is different than psoriasis. We had a little problem with some of the insurance companies initially, but in Crohn's we give an IV load, which is weight-based, it's around six milligrams per kilogram, and then they get maintenance of 90 every eight weeks, not every 12 weeks as the psoriasis dosing. And um, this was data from the uh, usikinumab, the Unity trials. Okay, so Unity 1, these were people who failed anti-TNFs or lost response. So they grabbed the bull by the horns. We were actually surprised. Usually, you know, you have a new agent trying to sneak in as an easy, easy case. Remember, well, everything we told you today is people with an who failed anti-TNFs are harder. Their first trial, the Unity One, they actually said you had to have failed or been resp uh, uh, lost response to or SAE to an anti-TNF. And Unity Two is what they were naive. And if you look at the data, so this is the. It's hard to read this slide. This is the the week six and week eight data. The IV dose that we end up giving is in blue. So in Unity One, so people who had failed anti-TNFs six to eight weeks out already remission rates was with, well, roughly twenty percent which is pretty good, just, just that's after one IV dose. So one IV dose put 20% of the patients into remission, and if you're anti-TNF naive, up to 40% went into remission by week eight, 35 to 40, week six, week eight, with one IV dose. Quite, quite traumatic one dose. Uh, and then um, this was clinical response rates, so that, that, was, that was remission rates, response rates were roughly twice as high. Generally, response about twice as high as remission. And then subsequently, uh, you had the maintenance trial. So as I said, the induction was just one IV dose. And then the patients uh, were treated for, about, uh, for the rest of the year, roughly, um, uh, with uh, the maintenance uh, therapy. And the maintenance therapy was given either 90 milligrams every 12 weeks, which is in orange, which is what we do for psoriasis, or every eight weeks, which is in blue. And this is the primary endpoint, so basically after 44 weeks, so roughly a year out, you can see that clinical remission is in half the patients, this, uh, and uh, clinical response in 60% of the patients, and um, those who are in remission at the beginning of the maintenance trial, two-thirds of them were in remission at the end. So if you're already doing well with that first dose, you could accept, did, did very well, and steroid-free remission in roughly uh, 50%. And then uh, this was the data in Unity 1. So these were the TNF failures. So you still had 40% in remission uh, at the end of um, roughly a year. And if you were TNF naive, you had 62%. So the data is quite impressive for the ustekinumab, uh, which is available. And you've seen some of this before. I'm not going to belabor you um, with the points on these slides. So a lot of people ask about data of ustekinumab on Crohn's fistula. This is data that is just from inductions, but see nearly um, 600 patients, um, about 12% uh, had open fistulas, and at week eight, the fistula response and resolution was actually the same, about a quarter. So about a quarter of the fistulas by week eight um, were resolved on, uh, with just, just one IV dose. Now, the safety with the use of kinemab is also very encouraging. There are no uh, black box warnings um, for the agent. Um, the risks of um, any SAEs, um, headaches, thralgias, nausea, et cetera, infections, was the same between the drug and placebo. The only difference was that there were higher infusion reactions or injection site reactions with the drug than with placebo, which is expected, but still pretty low, so less than, less than 5%. 
So we had asked uh, issues about immunogenicity and drug levels before. So the immunogenicity was very low, only 2.3%. 2, and just like every other study you've ever seen, higher trough levels, you have higher rates of remissions. And this is interesting. And this has actually been recently published um, uh, here in 2018. Combination therapy with ustekinumab and immune modulators did not impact drug levels and does not impact response. So right now with ustekinumab, we don't have an indication where you would need to give and a combination therapy, although you might choose to do so if you have someone who has already made antibodies to other biologics. And the gold trough level is, is round one, greater than, greater than 0.8. So you may remember that I showed you um, that uh, the IL-12 and 23 share the uh, P40 subunit. Well, there's also just IL-23's P19 subunit. And a few of these drugs that are in, in research studies or on the market for psoriasis um, block just the P19 subunit of um, the uh, for IL-23. And what's interesting is in psoriasis, believe it or not, even though the same company makes the IL-1223 and the IL-23, they actually did a trial against their own drug and showed that the IL-23 blockade was superior to blocking the IL-1223. So blocking just the, the P19, IL-23 seems to be the key of the combination of IL-12 and 23, at least in psoriasis. And it's, it's interesting, bold, bold moves. Go after, go after your own drug that's on the market with a new one. Uh, I know, they're braver than I am. I never would have done that. I would have, I'm a chicken. I'm like, oh, I'll go for the safe stuff. Uh, so this is Braz... Brazicamib, uh, as uh, Dave showed a little bit earlier, this is um, a week 12 data. The drug is in black and the placebo is not. And you can see the drug rates are double that of the placebo. And when you look at clinical response and a 50% reduction in calprotectin or CRP, you see a huge difference. So this is very encouraging. Week 24, same endpoints, also, also very nice too. So remission rates yeah, 27, 20%, but you see um, a good response rates and decreased inflammation. And then rizinkizumab, uh, we're just trying to make sure we make these as difficult to, to pronounce as possible. Um, the pool data is the dark blue of the drug. Uh, this is the higher dose of the two, and the gray is, is placebo. You can see that these outcomes, which is hard to read, this is clinical remission, this is clinical response. You can see you're looking at remission rates uh, up to 36% in response rates, 41% uh, with this, with this uh, drug too. So uh, the good news is, is that these are uh, agents, some of which, are, one of which is on the market and others which hopefully will be on the market uh, for psoriasis and hopefully for Crohn's disease. They're also uh, undergoing clinical trials in ulcerative colitis as well. So it's kind of fascinating that um, while we were targeting IL-12 and 23, it turns out the IL-23 targeting, at least in the skin disease, is superior, and we'll see about with, with, um, with IBD. So just as a summary, so ustekinumab is FDA approved for moderate severe Crohn's disease and plaque psoriasis. This is indicated for both of our patients because one of them had psoriasis and it failed steroids or an immune modulator or anti-TNF. They didn't fail the anti-TNF. The other one developed the psoriasis, bad psoriasis um, on the anti-TNF, and despite being on steroids, was still very sick. Um, there's no, very low infection rate. There's no black box warning. And, and make sure you give the Crohn's dosing just to make it a little more fun for people. If you don't already know this, you actually have to get approval usually separately for the IV and the injectable dose because the IVs paid off the medical benefits and the injectables paid off the pharmacy benefits. Um, when the drug first came out, since it was already in the market as an injectable for psoriasis, we usually got the injectable approval right away, but <laughs> you have to give the IV dose first. Um, it se seems things have been smoothed out, and for many of the insurance plans, you actually can use that as your first biologic if patients qualify with moderate severe Crohn's disease. So thank you for your attention for this, and uh, thank you, Ajua, for, um, for being here for this presentation.